My name is Rihard and I will talk about function interfaces and what we can do or how we can detect to, to prevent our users from misusing our functions. Uh, I come from Hungary. Maybe the most uh, famous building you can recognize the country from is our legislative building, the parliament. And uh, I'm from the Utrecht Lorand University. And this is my second time at uh, C++ now. I was here last time in 2019 uh, talking about modules. So what we will talk about is there will be a bit of definition about uh, how the, the academic world and the literature has uh, defined the problems that the users can make when we uh, misuse our functions. Then we will talk about implicit conversions, just a bit of a primer so we are on the same page with it. And then we will talk about what I call type-based guard, so an, an improved solution over the existing uh, name-based uh, method. So, uh, the argument selection defect uh, is when a developer, when calling a function, uh, select into the function call an argument from some set of available expressions, maybe other variables that are visible in the scope, the wrong one. This is what the literature calls. It's been established uh, in, in previous research by Google. Like on the example slide, we have, you know, two strings with um, values that don't really match. At least one of them doesn't really match the uh, the, the intended way of using the function, but because, you know, these are just strings, the compiler will happily accept them. Um, argument swaps are a subset, a special case of argument selection defects when we have all the variables or, or expressions that we want to pass in the function call, but we just swap them between the individual parameters so, for example, if I put the two strings in the previous example function next to one another, I will invite my users to accidentally put the, the host name first if they don't look at the, the, um, you know, the, the, the ID, what it says uh, about the parameters. So there are plenty of existing methods to, to find this issue. I have several good papers uh, linked in the footnote, the slides will be available later, but all of them generally go about that you name your things properly. The compiler doesn't care about names, but we humans do and we can make tools that do. So if you have properly named variables, like as you can see on the example, there are methods to, to find this issue. If you look at any uh, book of algorithms, you will have plenty of string metrics and uh, distance functions. Recent research worked about extracting morphemes uh, from the words. You can analyze the distance on the keyboard, like someone just, you know, mistyped something. There are ways to extract the sound, how it would sound in particular languages and use that to to, to find the potential swap. Now, the problem with most of the previous papers uh, and, and, and existing research from the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years, is that uh, most of the research suffered to link rot. I, I couldn't find the, the implementation apart from what's written in the paper. I know for a fact that there are two tools that I have investigated uh, built, both of them built on top of Clang, which use the names of the, the, the arguments and the parameters in a comparison to find potential swaps. So let's see how these potential swaps look like. And these are examples from existing code. So this was out badly, and then people most likely found them and sent bug reports and they were fixed. And you know, here's a, a function call, some very properly named variables, X and Y, and they were passed in a wrong order. And another case we found, we also found, I should say, was in Firefox, that there was this function that takes a bool and some, some numeric type, and the literal force was in the wrong place. 
and the compiler happily accepted it. Now, uh, there's a bit of problem with, with using names. So what I will be talking about with types isn't an antagonist, it's a complement for, for the, to, to help our users better. But the big problem with names is that you need, to, you need to have those names or somehow figure them out. So if we look at some more complex or, or nameless expressions, literal. So for example, here's this function call. Okay, this, we can figure out if the reference will take the same name, the function call, we will assign some to the, to the argument name so we can synthesize things. Okay, how about this one? where maybe we can map literals to, to their names in English, assuming the code is written in English. Yeah, a bit more tricky. And then, of course, what about this one? Like, okay, 4 plus 8, but, but how can we map it to some sort of parameter name in the function? And the biggest problem is that, you know, sometimes people publish uh, their code in a way that the header is only this. This is all that the compiler sees. You have to go and read the manual or, or read the contract or whatever supplementary material. And okay, that function doesn't have any parameter names, so we just need to do even more things to figure it out. Right, so how do these analysis results look like? So this is from Postgres and uh, this is done by one of the, the clank tidy checks that I'm involved in. So bit of a self-advertisement here. So basically we can say that uh, we can show the developer, okay, here is your function core. Here are the two arguments you might have swapped. And if we look at the, the header and point the user to the point where the function was declared or if we have the definition defined, we will see something very strange. So we have the, the name of the variable that we passed, the argument was reloid, and then the parameter was rolid or roll ID or, or something. And these are just, you know, one letter swap in the name. And in this code, this is C code, obviously, but in this code, we can see that there is something very, very strange going on with the type safety of this project. We have these OID types. I think it stands for order ID. Uh, sorry, uh, it either stands for object ID or for owner ID. I'm not exactly sure about it. I, I don't know Postgres from the inside out. But there is something even more uh, problematic. Sorry, wrong direction. There is something even more problematic going on with these sorts of analysis. So what I would like to call reactiveness to proactiveness or a posteriori to a priori. So if we do this sort of analysis where we check the names against each other, then what we will do is find problematic core sites after the fact in the user's code you know, these are tools not embedded into the compiler. There were previous talks, very nice talks about, you know, using tools. And the problem is that it might cause false positives, but you have to make the mistake to find it out. Now, what if instead we did something better? We are library developers here, you know, most of us, do code that other people use, we can help those people not to make the mistake by using uh, types. And by using the type system to guard us, we can do all these swaps or most of these swaps to be compile errors. And this is one very funny slide I like because in my experience, this is the only slide where I can safely say that compile errors should be green. That's the good thing. And we can express our intent cleanly. So a bit of a backtrack to those false positives with regards to the name-based analysis is, here's an example from Git. There's a function called for the diff and the analysis works. The heuristics are fine. There's a parameter named one, two, and I code it with two, one, and it produced the report, but it's very unlikely that we will ever fix it. So, 
when I was starting to do this research, I didn't know yet that there's actually a guideline in the C++ core guidelines about this issue. Uh, here's a screenshot of it. This is the older version uh, from 2000, late 2019, I think. And mostly through our communication with, with Herb Sutter and the, the other contributors to the guidelines, we have actually uh, worked on improving the guideline a little bit from all the cases that we investigated. But all in all, what the guideline says and what I'm talking about here is that forget the names as much as we can. It's good for the human. The tools rarely do anything about it. And let's use types because we are in a strongly typed, statically typed language. Okay. There are a few problems with types and uh, with C++ with regards to types. Most of the existing works were for Java or sometimes for C, and there are a few cornerstones that I have built my case here. So, of course, you know, there's the type there for the, or the new syntax using. People use it. We all know it's bad, but we, we have to take care of it. So if we go by names, then comparing the type's name isn't okay either because, you know, there could be a type that's hiding some sort of platform-specific stuff that may be swappable on one platform or may not be on another. There's a bit of issue. I think yesterday uh, someone talked about the... There was a talk titled The R-Value Lifetime Disaster. And yes, the, the constant reference comes back here too. It binds to everything. It, it just chews up everything. You know, if something is a const ref and then you have some other type, then they can still be swapped in the general case. Um, a bit of a debate point is that depending on the coding guideline that you use, you know, let's just imagine memcopy which has, you know, one void star and one const void star. So if you have two non-const pointers past this argument, both will match to both parameters in, either, in any order because the const only applies in the definition. And there's also implicit conversions. One very powerful and very dangerous feature, pretty unique to C++. Uh, in the way how dangerous it is in C++. So, just for the sake, if someone hasn't been reading up the laws for implicit conversion day and night for the past years, let's look at a small example to be on the same page. So, I have some complex number in the, in the standard uh, representation, how anyone would learn it in school, and I have some sort of function maybe a, a scalar multiplication, okay? And then I have those two local variables. Their names indicate that one is a scalar and one is a complex, and then I do a swapped call. I say, I pass the complex to the scalar and I pass the scalar to the complex. All right, what's gonna happen? Well, in this context, we don't know. We have to we have to see the entire definition of the of the type. Of course, the compiler knows it. And if someone wrote a converting constructor and a conversion operator, this swapped call will be accepted by the compiler and might as well just not do what we wanted. So what happens in that call is that we want to pass a, com a complex to an integer and the other way around. So in one pass, we will call that defined conversion operator, which we defined in a way that it throws away the imaginary part, keeps the real part. All right, now we have a double in our hands. And the language defines a way for doubles to become integers, which is by throwing away the floating part. So we get a big zero, but that's an integer and that can be passed. And Analogously, on the other pass, we can always extend an integer to a double, which has zero on the floating part. And then every real number is a complex number, as we learned in school. So it's, it's eight as a complex number with no imaginary part, but that's a complex number that can be passed to the function. So if we look at 
these two cores, I have uh, uh, LED the local variables here, these two cores are equivalent. Instead of passing, you know, half minus quarter or something, I just pass zero and eight and it all goes forward. So the language actually has a bit elaborate rules on, on implicit conversions. I will try to summarize it here. So we all go home knowing that these things can happen. So an implicit conversion sequence is always three steps at most. Each step has a maybe in front of it, so you don't have to do it. But if you do it, you have to do it in order. So we have uh, nine buckets to fill. The first part is a standard conversion sequence, which begins with, which begins with two possible steps. One of them is value decay. We shall just summarize it as that value decay. And then we can, you know, switch our built-in numeric types around. So stuff like changing from int to long or decaying away an enum or doing that stuff with, you know, integer to float and then we also have some other weird stuff like converting to the base class. Okay, okay, we keep the list of principle. We can also convert to a void pointer. Uh, these are uh, exclusive. So, so one of these will happen in the numeric part. And then the null constant, depending on which language you are using, is, can be always any sort of pointer. And the most interesting part, which I did not want to elaborate, you can read the standard, of course, is that Basically, whatever you can imagine that's a built-in type, it might as well eventually just become a bool somewhere. All right, so we swapped around our built-in types, fine. Now we can do, if they were not, if, if they were a function pointer, you can always lose the no except. So the function pointer adjustment is a bit tricky uh, wording. Just say, you can always lose the no except. And of course, you can always add on some more qualified stuff, like add on a const volatile. You can add these on if you are a, a nasty type in the middle. So like const array of non-const whatever. It's, a, it's looking a bit like calculus textbooks. It's a bit hard. And after all this is done, you can find a user-defined conversion, which is not marked explicit, execute that function, Hopefully it will be inlined in the runtime and then its result can go through the same thing all over again. If it's one unique pass, of course, if it's ambiguous, hopefully the compiler will see it and give you a warning. So these two things are equivalent because there's a conversion between the two and a bit of a, a fun derail or digression I've tried tinkering around with Clang and cut out from the language implementation all the implicit conversions I could, and some of them could be removed without uh, significantly breaking stuff. Of course, if your project depended on these, that were broken. Uh, so did the void star. As we can see, some of these are, you know, old C heritage. The booze can go. Uh, the decays might be able to go, uh, but there are two things that really can't go because when you remove these, everything just falls apart so much. So it's very likely that we cannot fix the language now about these things. Maybe we don't have to because we can define our own types. So if we, as library developers, help our users by giving good types and good interfaces to them. So this is all about the interface. Then there's this concept called strong typing, which we will kind of get into. But I would like to say that maybe as a starter, we shouldn't give strong types, but just stronger types. And a bit of a pun here that this might be trickier than it sounds at first. So, what's the solution? Well, I have to admit that I have been knowing what sort of talks will be on the conference, and I do not know the solution. There have been plenty of papers about uh, the, it's called Opaque Type Dev by Walter Brown, so 
the fix itself has been discussed long, long ago. But the good thing is that there are a few talks on this very conference that will talk about making these strong types. So conveniently, I will not pretend that I know about how to do it because I admit I don't. Please go and watch these other talks, maybe this week, maybe later. Uh, and this slide is already outdated because I think one of the talks of Peter has been moved to Friday. So there are other talks. What I want to talk about, given this, is how we can find where to do. So if the other presenters will surely talk about the solution itself, then I can tell you here's a tool and a method to show you where to apply those solutions. And the core concept behind this is that uh, what, what I like to call the mixable adjacent parameter range. So how does it look like? It's it's uh, tricky. It's more trickily worded than how how uh, simple the idea is once you see it. So basically, what we do, look at the functions, and just ask a few questions. Imagine you are a user who wants to use this API badly, and go through. If I have my value here, can I pass it there? Sure, int is int. Everyone will accept that. If I have a double, can I pass it the wrong way? So can I swap either of those ints with the double? As we saw, yes, there's a conversion that exists in the language. Can I swap the int? Well, if we assume the previous complex implementation, then of course, that converts to double, that converts to a complex, the double converts to a complex, and you know, you just go through all these, these questions on your API for every function, and then, just for the sake of argument, let's imagine there isn't a conversion between std string because you know complex numbers can be written in many ways. So we just say no, and boom, there's our range. And if you look at this, it will be you know the edges of a whole graph. Uh, it sounds like a lot of checks, but I will show an empirical example. It's really not that costly. So what we did. Uh, we created uh, a clank tidy check. It's not yet in clank tidy. It's in a very long, I don't know, 25 my final, but hopefully it's coming. And I have run the analysis on the projects you see on the slides. There are a few C projects in there, but you know, some of the strong type solutions actually work in C too. Okay, you can't write user-defined conversion methods because there are no methods in C, but you can write wrapper structs and stuff like that. So, so seeing how C API is bad is also useful to us, especially if you know we are writing a library that has to expose itself with extern C. And backtracking a little to the to the the complexity question, like you know, we have for every function a bunch of uh, questions from the compiler about convertibility of types. Uh, these are all the analysis in the most complex mode. We will get to it later what it means that the analysis can be made more complex. But th this is the mode I've run the analysis with, you know, the most of the stuff the compiler has to do. And as you can see, uh, okay, LLVM, LLVM is a beast. Of course, it takes an hour to, to do the analysis. The rest of the projects are mere minutes, like five minutes, 10 minutes, or even less. And all these numbers are basically consistent with the compile time. So yeah, if the machine is slow and compiles the project slow, of course, the analysis will be slow. But all these questions about the, the convertibility of types in an optimized release build, it actually doesn't show any significant difference compared to you know running any other analysis. So it looks bad on paper, but it's it it can really just be put into if you are running clank tidy in your IDE, it will just it, it won't be it won't feel slower. So let's see one particular result. Uh, we are we were running the analysis with code checker, which Full disclosure, I'm actually a developer of, 
and uh, this is how it shows the warnings from the from the clank tidy uh, terminal output. So you can see here's a picture from from the the Tesseract uh, OCR engine, and the checker will tell you here it here is where the range starts. It has this many elements in our case three elements. It highlights the range for you now uh, uh, when you are using in the command line and it will tell you, you know, these types actually, they are swappable because they are all ints. So it will tell you not just that here is a range of three that's swappable, but as much as it can to explain to you why it is. Because if I look at class ID just in the code, I won't immediately see that it's an int. Uh, Here's another example. This is from uh, OpenCV, which actually shows something interesting about OpenCV's API. Because as you can see, there's a lot of parameters which all have the type input array, which is a very specific tag type in OpenCV. According to the documentation, it's only used to tell the user that these are input parameters because Unlike some other languages like, I don't know, Ada or C Sharp, C++ doesn't have a language level way of expressing what's an output parameter and what's an input parameter. But the worst part is that, as you can see, there's a bunch of parameters that are clearly related to each other. We will get back to this term later. And then there are some other arrays which don't because, you know, there are these matrices and these coefficients and... And if they are all input array, and input array can be constructed from anything you can imagine uh, that is used in this project, basically, then you are just a, a, a comma press away from making a mistake. So let's look at the, the chances in numbers. So the earlier paper that I started the presentation upon, that, that paper from Rice and from, from other engineers at Google, uh, said that the more parameters your function has, the more chance of mistake that you might make. And without looking at the core sites, because they were analyzing the core sites, we are going for the function definitions for the interface only. You don't have to make a bad call for us to find that this function may be called in a bad way. It may be not. Of course, there can always be false positives, but in general, it can warn you this is a dangerous construct. And this is just a big bucket of average numbers. And as, as we see, the, the chance of mistake, especially if we consider uh, what I, what I uh, dubbed generous const and implicit conversions, instead of just strictly looking at are these two types the same after you know, resolving type depths and all that stuff, it, it grows much more when... when uh, in the in the bigger so if we move to functions that have more parameters the growth is bigger if we also enable these these uh, relaxations some other data uh, the individual numbers are not not that important I, I'm trying to show the percentages to see so if we look at the projects we have plenty of projects from different sizes from different domains of course, the sample can be biased, but I, I would like to think that it it kind of picked together a good set of, of uh, everything. We just looked at GitHub, what, are, what were the most active or most start projects at the time, and sprinkled in some that we also kind of know from the inside. And as we see, uh, there are some projects where the fact that they are mathematical or mathematics-based, such as OpenCV is the sort of the biggest offender here, where the the potentially bad functions are around or even over 50%. But in general, one-fourth to one-fifth of the functions have some issues in general. And then the other columns just de detail how much the individual relaxation. So if I say const t and t is the same thing, or if I say, okay, let's show me what mistakes I can make with implicit conversions. But one of the slides that I like the most that, that uh, I, I created from the results of this research is, is this slide. So what this slide details, okay, let's put into a bucket every 
C and C++ projects and uh, let's, you know, measure the individual strictness as different input data because they are essentially different analysis. Uh, th this is the, the cumulative, the, um, the distribution, shall we say. So, so the distribution of the culprit, the, the perpetrators, the types that are making this swappability issue come up. And of course, the, the fundamental types are the biggest offenders. And of course, as we relax the algorithm, the, 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 the share of the fundamental types go up insanely. I mean, in the, in the C++ mode, it's like, what, 70%? So, so, you know, everyone is just using int and double everywhere, and then everyone is just using strings, so, of course. Uh, the, the, and these, these are all the projects, so the numbers are roughly 8 and 8 project, and, and, um, and it's, it's what makes the danger happen. But there is one big issue with this analysis. I mean, for with the with the relaxation, given a sufficiently big project, you will have a bunch of warnings, like a staggering amount. Okay, I have selected LLVM, which is not the full LLVM project, just the 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 part with deals with with Clang. So it's just just LLVM Clang and the the Clang tidy uh, suite, and this one in the in the most relaxed mode, produced seven more than seven thousand individual warnings, and you know some of these are just two functions that might be swapped around. Some of these are ten long ranges. So something has to be done because if you show this to any developer, they will tell you to 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 go away. They don't want to deal with you after this. And in fact. There are some ways we can deal with this. So there are some functions, some categories of functions, which you cannot really fix. So if you take a, a plus or you take the max function, then of course you, you can't really do anything better with the types on the interface without, you know, just making your API look very stupid. So the, the max function will look like that. Of course, in the standard, it's templated, but, but imagine if it, ends, it has to look like that. An addition has to look like that if it's, you know, mathematically a, a binary operation. And we can filter those. And what we can also do is what we found when we evaluated our findings is that sometimes in projects, there are functions where it is kind of clearly visible that the order of the arguments don't really matter in a way that, uh, of course, the function will produce a different result if you call it swapped, but it's not inherently a problem if you call it swapped, such as this, this imaginary, you know, message emit fills three lines on the screen or something like that. And if we track back a little to, to the C++ uh, core guidelines, Originally, the title of the guideline had this word unrelated in it, which was a contention point because it wasn't well defined what they mean by unrelated. So what's better than coming up with your own definition? Now, the new definition says something about avoid the same type if the function can be invoked in some other ordering with a different meaning. So truly the guidelines have traded one vague definition to, to something I think is even vaguer, but let's see what we can do. And, and I, I, call, I will call this relatedness uh, consistently. So let's look at this fun Let's look at this code snippet. Okay, so clearly the developer wanted to use A and B together and X and Y together. Cool. Let's, let's not warn about these parameters. If you toggle this, this, uh, this uh, filtering method in the, in the check. So this is, in, this is exposed to the user and you can toggle it to your, to your uh, heart's content. Okay, let's look at this function call. 
So these are two different function, uh, sorry, two different usages of your variables. So always imagine these calls are wrapped inside functions with parameters. So if the developer in two separate calls passed the, the two parameters A and B to the same functions, same overload, same parameter index, then maybe it means they wanted to use it together. Okay, let's not worry about that. Here's another example, which is, I, I, I like to call them, uh, um, so the previous one was the dispatchers, these ones are the, the, the selectors. So depending on some condition, this function from where this code snippet is, uh, will either give you one of its parameters or the other. Okay, that means the developer clearly thinks and shows to us in the definition that these two parameters should be used together. Cool, let's not worry about it. And also another case that we implemented was if you use the, so, so Clank tidy isn't pass or flow or data or whatever sensitive. It's, it's using the syntax tree, nothing else. So I cannot express sadly in Clank tidy that, you know, I want to know that if uh, L name and R name are used together, then it means that the variable they were created from is used together. That would be the, the, the flow sensitive kind of analysis. What I did in Clank Tidy was to say, okay, you have two, two structs or two records of the same type. You call the same member function or access the same member variable on them. Okay, you want to use it in a similar way. Let's not worry about it. And another, so this is, this is what fixes the, the example with the minimum function. Here's the other example. So what if these parameters are not used similarly in any way or shape or form I can deduce from looking at your code. Well, you still did give your function parameters a name and I, nothing forbids me from using it, so I will use it. And if we look at this function, and this is just the, the, the dumbed down example of that message I made from earlier, but here are some paraphrased actual examples from those 15-ish projects that I looked at, there's clearly a pattern here, right? People just like to say text one, text two, LHS, RHS, or, or the, the bottom one is from, uh, actually from OpenCV where it was called QMOT, RMOT, TMOT. I have no idea what this means, but these, clearly these matrices might not, might want to be used together in some way. I don't know, one of them is the camera pad and the tilt and the shift and whatever, yo and pitch and stuff. So we can also filter based on these conditions. And here's another uh, table with the numbers. So if the previous such landscape shape table was about the, the relaxations of the rule, so you want to match more things, you want to find the implicit conversions, this is the one, okay, the matching was done. I now know according to the type system, what's problematic. Let's just throw away all the results that I can kind of safely say, or, or maybe I can say that if they misuse it, if my clients, if my users, if, if another project misuses it, they will still be safe because I meant that these should be used together. And this table shows that uh, how many functions so these are not the individual ranges. These are just the functions that may have more ranges uh, matched to them uh, can be silenced. And it's really, really interesting to say that even the, the relatedness rules, so these, those four rules about appearing in the same expression in some way, threw away 60% of the results. So given those... I don't know, let's just look at look at OpenCV. That's, that's a very mathematics-based tool or, or, or code. If we had uh, 3,000 functions matched originally, uh, 2.3,000, so 70% of them were silenced. And what this means, together with the fact that if you use this check or something similar rule, where the users can toggle, 
how I would like to, to have people use this rule is that you start with the strictest, most filtered way. So you don't enable implicit conversions, you don't care about them, but you care about throwing away all these, these name patterns and these together reused related functions and fix those. You look at those results, you, you come to some conclusion about whether that's really sure or can be fixed, like can it be even made strongly typed? And if it can, you fix it. And then you, you, you play around with the controls, like how relaxed the rule you want and just go through the project. Of course, LLVM is a very big project, so you won't really start with doing the boost, but if you start slow and just make it grow outwards from somewhere, I think we can really, really go around and have our users be helped uh, in the next, I don't know, the, 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 the next major release somewhere down the line in, in your project in particular. In addition, there are some types I picked bool as an example. There's another flag uh, in the implementation where I where you can say I don't care about these types. Even if there are parameters which can be swapped around, but if they have this or that or that another type, we just type the name in, it will be silenced. And interestingly, uh, there's a bunch of of findings regarding bool strictly bool only ranges. So you have like five bool parameters next to one another. And I know that bool can be made more safe based on, you know, enum classes, but my idea uh, with this rule is that if you use an enum class for bool, it will just make your code more verbose. And maybe that's not where we should start with it, or maybe that's exactly where we should start. Uh, I haven't, because I didn't, don't yet know the answer on how to fix an actual project like this. Uh, this is sadly kind of my conclusion with the whole thing, because this is where the, the current status of, of my research ended. And uh, we will just go through this because the URLs, no one will, of course, remember. You can click on them and stuff if you want to read those papers and look at those, those projects and whatnot. And a bit of a kind of self-advertisement that we used Code Checker not just because it's a, it's a tool we ourselves developed, but because, you know, if you don't use it in a way that you just use Clank Tidy in your IDE, but rather you use Code Checker or maybe there are some other similar tools like that, which allows you to upload these findings into some server somewhere you can start a web server and just upload stuff to it then you can click about you can you can tell yourself okay this is a false positive i won't fix it this should be fixed this type should be called i don't know velocity and i used our own tool to to make uh, the investigation happen when i was uh, coming up with my real, uh, with my heuristics so if you can and you are starting to write a new library or starting to improve a new library, don't use built-in types because you can't really turn off the implicit conversions. There are no, uh, I think there are no compiler flags. Definitely, if you try to, to fix the compiler in this way, it will behave erratically because there's a lot to, to, to unpack when it comes to, you know, should we disable the float to int conversion, but maybe we should keep the null pointer stuff or, or, we should disable point, array to pointer decay and don't care about the C rules, but 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 we should keep the everything boost. So it becomes kind of a kind of a heated argument. But either way, uh, I think it's worth when you are you, when you are creating a library that you are helping the users not to make mistake. Defensive design before the fact. So give me an API. I really have to try hard to misuse. Of course, everything can be misused, but make it hell for me if I want to misuse it. And of course, the compiler won't fix everything for me. That's why there are extra tools. Let's help users, encourage them to use tools. There has been a talk earlier about, about code analysis in general. Find the low-hanging fruits. Find all the, the int sequences that don't make sense and strong type them first. And uh, sadly, 
I think my time expired now, but if there are some questions and we may go out of bounds a little bit, then I would be I would be happy to answer. Uh, both on Zoom and I'm now looking at the Discord. So yes, uh, Peter Peter is in the in the chat and. Uh, <laughs> He pointed out what I also found out, that the, the talk was moved. So yes, of course, uh, I made that slide last week. So always use the official sources, of course. Please, uh, if you are adventurous, the, the links to the two tidy checks, none of them are yet merged into tidy because I'm uh, dealing with the code review, of course. Uh, you can try patching your own clang and running it that way and then just, just you know, try it out or, you know, make a regular expression int, whatever, comma, int, and then just grab your code. <laughs> the compiler is only needed when you want to do something more elaborate than that, like type depth. Then I think we are done. So thank you for attending.